Hello everybody, my name is Professor Rich and we are learning English today. We're talking about aesthetics. Welcome, welcome. And let's get on with it. So we're getting a bit philosophical today. We are talking about aesthetics. Look at the pronunciation there. Aesthetics. We're going to talk about beauty. What is beauty? We're going to talk about created or not created beauty. We're going to talk about beauty as an internal opinion or an internal thing or an external thing. So is beauty in our minds or is beauty out in the world? And then we will talk about culture and personal taste and we will wrap this all up with some homework. Hello to everybody in the chat. I hope you're doing well. Daisy, it's good to see you. Pavia, it's good to see you. And Sleepwalker becoming a regular on the streams. How are you doing today? And I'd like to take a moment to say thank you very much to the community which we have and the support which I receive from that community. It's very much appreciated and actually the only reason why this channel exists and I do streams is because of the community support. I would take this moment to remind everyone to act and speak respectfully to each other especially in public spaces. And if, for some reason, you find yourself in disagreement with someone, then I recommend that you disagree in a respectful manner or just ignore the other person and enjoy the stream. Thank you very much. Let's get on with the lesson. So let's start with some pronunciation looking at the word itself. This is a Greek word, which is why we have this peculiar start with A-E-S. And the pronunciation is aesthetics. 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 You can see the phonemic alphabet here. The schwa at the start. Uh, us, us, de, de. Aste aesthetics, aesthetics. We might notice that this T has a little bit more aspiration. It's got more H in there. Aesthetics, aesthetics. That's if you're very, very, very good at pronunciation and listening to pronunciation. So, aesthetics. What is aesthetics? Aesthetics is the study and discussion and discovery of beauty. Aesthetics is all about beauty. So, what is beauty? Let's take a look at some pictures here, which in some way represent beauty. I want you to look at those pictures and tell me what in those pictures is beautiful. What is beautiful in those pictures? How do those pictures relate to beauty? I will be typing quite a lot in the chat today because I don't want to put notes on the screen because there's a lot on the screen already. So I will be typing some notes in the chat and we'll see how that goes. What is beautiful in those pictures? In the top left, picture one, we have what looks like a lovely country house in beautiful natural surroundings. It 
It's a very beautiful house. The surroundings also very beautiful. We have an interesting contrast because we have natural beauty and we have something created, something constructed. Daisy says those mountains are beautiful because of the green surroundings and the large windows. The design is symmetrical almost. We can see a lot of symmetry in the design. Often people talk about symmetry being a part of beauty. I'll write that in the chat, chat symmetry. Symmetry. Symmetry is when one side looks similar to or the same as another side. So the obvious example of symmetry is using a mirror. You put a mirror to something and you can see a perfectly symmetrical image. Sleepwalker says nothing can be more beautiful than the creation of nature. Nothing can be more beautiful than the creation of nature. That's a very interesting comment. And we will consider that as we go through the class. Let me say it again. Listen. Nothing can be more beautiful than the creation of nature. There's a lot going on with that comment, which makes it very interesting. Hello there, Dreamer. Good day to you. And hello to METD English. It's always good to see you. Let's have a look at the top right so I think the top right is even more about the natural surroundings. What do we have in the top right? We have a mountain and a forest and the blue sky. And actually in the top right, we don't have any signs of man-made beauty. There are no signs there of man-made beauty only of natural beauty. So very much we've got the idea there of a beautiful natural landscape. A beautiful natural landscape. Or even beauty in nature. Beautiful scenery. And how about the bottom left and the bottom right? That is picture number three and picture number four. What do you think they represent about beauty? It's an interesting comment there with amazing vocabulary from Daisy. She says, the snowy summit is glistening in the sun. Yep, I didn't notice that, but you are right. It looks like there is a bit of snow there on the mountain. I'm not quite sure, though, because of the image quality if that is actually snow. Still, lovely vocabulary about the snowy summit. Any comments there about picture three and four? That is the bottom left and the bottom right. What could you say about those pictures? Ah, so the bottom right is a beautiful sunset, is it? Balavi says, teacher, is it a controversial topic to talk about what beauty is? I don't think so, Balavi. In photo three, we see the creation of man. Music helps us in various situations. So, picture three, of course, represents music, and we could talk about beautiful music, beauty in music, and this gives us the idea that beauty need not, beauty need not be visual, because we can talk about beautiful music, a beautiful piece of music. 
We can talk about the aesthetics of a musical piece. And number four, this will surprise you. This will surprise you. Or maybe not. Number four is a video game. So with number four, we're talking about digital beauty. Digity, digitally created beauty. So number four is actually a video game. It's called Microsoft Flight Simulator. It's a very, very popular video game, and it has a very high reputation for the quality of graphics. This is a video game which actually encourages people sometimes to go on and become a real pilot. So yeah, number number the bottom right is in fact a video game. That's a plane. All right, so I want to move on to the next stage of this discussion. We're going to talk about two types of beauty. We're going to separate beauty into two types. And those types are created and not created. Now, when I say created, I mean created by humans. So we're not talking about god or a divine entity or aliens or even animals we're not talking about animals creating things we're talking about human creation so i want to separate beauty between created beauty created by humans and not created by humans beauty not created by humans So, my question for you is, what do we call beauty that's created by humans? What do we call it? What's a good word for beauty created by humans? And what do we call beauty that's not created by humans? So what do we call beauty that's created by humans and what do we call beauty that is not created by humans? <laughs> wow, straight away, you know, you guys are very, very intelligent. I thought about this for some time, but you're very, very intelligent. Well done, sleepwa Sleepwalker. The, 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 the term which I think is very useful for talking about created beauty is art. So I think that's a good term for describing beauty that has been created. Created beauty is art. We still have my notes on there. That's a shame, but never mind. <laughs> so created beauty, art. And we can talk about different types of created beauty. That is different types of art. A discussion about what is art. Well, that's a discussion for another day. But tell me in the chat now, what types of art can you think of? So if we think about all of the created beauty that humans make, what can you think of? What types? So we had poetry. Poetry is one. What other types of created beauty are there in the world? What types of art are there in the world? Answers in the chat. Paintings, sculptures, music, drama, arts and crafts. Paintings, again, pictures, which could mean for photographs. abstract art graffiti and avant-garde so there daisy you're talking about different types of visual art different types of painting really 
architecture. That's right, Mina, architecture. So we also have fashion. We have digital arts, performative art. Performative art is acting and musical performance. We have culinary arts. What is culinary art? Culinary art. The subject is called the culinary arts. We've also got product design and landscaping. So landscaping is really interesting because with landscaping, you take a natural landscape, natural canvas, and then you create something with that. So we could think of things like gardeners, landscape gardeners who have to create a beautiful garden from nature. That's, that's the idea of landscape as art calligraphy yes which is fancy writing so yes cakes says vladimir so one type of culinary art is cakes when we say culinary culinary art basically we're talking about cooking so that's created art. Let's talk about not created art. That is natural art, natural beauty, not natural art, natural beauty. So if we think about natural beauty, where can we see natural beauty? Mountains. Good. Palavi says, what do we call a person who lives in a forest? I think that's called... Perhaps a hermit? Do you mean who lives alone in a forest or who lives with other people? Mina says forests, rivers, waterfalls, landscape, says Anua. Okay, so I've got a few more ideas here. We have flora. Flora is the scientific name for plants and flowers. Also, we have animals. We've got landscapes. Landscapes include mountains, valleys, fields. We have water features. Water features like waterfalls and so on. We have geological forms, so interesting rock formations that were naturally formed. We've got weather phenomena, so people sometimes talk about the beautiful snow. How beautiful is the snow? Or even the rain. Rain can be beautiful sometimes. So weather, weather phenomena. I'll just type that in the chat, weather phenomena. Phenomena just means something happening. Palavi said what, Palavi? I'm lost. The sky and the stars and space. That's right, Anawat. So we call those celestial bodies and celestial events. Celestial bodies and celestial events basically means things in space and things that happen in space. Celestial bodies and celestial events. We can, of course, appreciate the natural beauty of celestial bodies and celestial events. An example of celestial bodies, stars, planets, comets. An example of celestial events, a comet colliding with another comet, a star exploding, etc., etc. Moonlight, says Dreamer. Yes, very good. Okay, so now that we have this idea of created and non-created beauty, let me give you a famous 
proverb, famous saying. Maybe some of you already are thinking of what this proverb could be. What proverb, what famous proverb relates to this subject? Beauty. What famous English proverb relates to beauty? I'll just give you a few seconds to see if someone in the chat has an idea. I'll start you off. Beauty. Oh, Sleepwalker, you are too, you're too knowledgeable for this. And Anawat as well. And there's a good one from Vitelli. Nice. That's, that's interesting, but it's not the one we're going for. Yes, it is. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The beholder, the beholder, behold. Behold means watch or observe. It's an old word that means watch this, observe this, behold, see this. So beholder means watcher or observer. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That means that the what we see as beautiful comes from us, from the person watching. So what do you guys think about this? Do you agree? Is beauty in the eye of the beholder or is beauty out there? This is the question. Is beauty in here and we, we perceive beauty from our perspective, our opinion, our perspective shapes beauty or... Are things naturally beauty, beautiful, and that beauty comes to us when we see it? This actually comes to an issue in aesthetics, which is about beauty and taste. And here we have a specific use of the word taste in English. So often when people think of the word taste in English, they think of how food tastes and they think they think of the perception of flavor in the mouth, the perception of flavor in the mouth. But this this taste here is a little different. This is about having a high quality sense of beauty. So it's the idea of a high quality sense of beauty. You have a lot of experience to talk about beauty in a certain area. And we talk about someone having good taste or having bad taste. If we say you have good taste, that means that you have a very high quality of perception of beauty in our opinion. So I say, oh, he has good taste. That means I think he has a high quality of perception of beauty. In the picture up there, we can see the example of a wine connoisseur. And we hope that a wine connoisseur has good taste in wine. Otherwise, why, why are they a wine connoisseur? Yes, Pallavi. So you're getting confused by the meaning of the word taste. As I said, the common meaning of taste that we often hear is related to the flavor of food. But taste can also mean our opinion and our perception of 
the quality of things. So if I say you have bad taste, that means I think your opinion about the quality of these things is bad. Like you have bad taste in films. You like bad films and you don't like good films. Or if I say you have great taste in video games, that means you know good video games. You can see if a video game is good quality. So that's the idea of taste. We could get a definition here which says a person's liking the ability to discern what is of good quality the ability to discern what is of good quality that's taste as a noun the ability to discern what is of good quality and even in that definition we have the word aesthetic which is what we're talking about today we're talking about aesthetics So, on this idea of taste, we come to a big philosophical problem, which is, is there really such a thing as beauty, or is beauty all in our heads? Is there really such a thing as beauty, or is beauty all in our heads? So, let's have a look at this here. What's that? If you can see on your screen. It's a little happy looky cat with its left paw in the air. Happy looky cat. So, happy looky cat. Is this a beautiful happy looky cat? What do you think in the chat? Do you think this is beautiful? Does it have beauty? Type your opinion in the chat. What do you think? Is this a beautiful... A beautiful lucky cat. Sleepwalker says all cats are beautiful. Pallavi says yes. Alexander says it's a Japanese cat. So, lots of people saying yes. Now the question is, is is it beautiful? Does the beauty come from this thing? Or does the beauty come from your opinion? Is it the value from your mind that puts beauty on this? If I show this to every person in the world, will everyone say it's beautiful? Or are there some people who will say no? It's not beautiful. And if so, does that mean that the beauty comes from us? We project beauty onto the things that we see, rather than the beauty being part of the thing. This is a philosophical problem. And the question is, is beauty subjective or objective? subjective or objective it's a big discussion in philosophy about many things subjective means it's all in our head and objective means it's nothing to do with us it's all outside so does it come from outside and we see it or is everything from inside and we project it onto our world subjective versus objective and here we have a little
Confucius-like quote to get you thinking, which says, if there is a flower but no human to see it, is the flower still beautiful? Can you have a beautiful flower if there is no one to see the flower? Julia says the flower in and of itself looks beautiful in nature. I like that in and of itself. In and of itself. In and of itself means that a quality of the flower is it's beautiful without a human. So Julia is saying that she thinks a flower is objectively beautiful objectively beautiful pavia says in the absence of a human or any observer the flower may still possess inherent qualities that many would consider beautiful inherent qualities so inherent here is the same as saying in and of itself so interestingly pavia and Julia have said something a little similar. And Pavia says, without an observer, there is no experience of beauty, but the objective attributes of the flower may still exist. Right, Pavia. However, what if there is no human observer, but there is an alien observer? However, aliens don't like the smell of flowers and they don't like colors so these aliens they think that the smell of flowers is bad and they think that colors are ugly so there's no human observer there's only an alien observer and they look at the flower and they say that smells bad and it's ugly is the flower still beautiful I like that, Sleepwalker. Well done. Nice use of the vocabulary here. Sleepwalker says, aliens are from the another planet, so they have their own taste. They have their own taste. Perfect use of the vocabulary from today. It's okay for people to have their own taste. And Mina says the same thing in different words. Mina says it's their perspective. So that's the same thing as saying... They have their own taste. So we're going to have a look at this idea of subjective beauty and how it changes. And one thing we could look at there is cultural variety. So think about that. Cultural variety in beauty. And let's get now to the beauty that everyone wants to talk about, which is about human beauty itself so cultural variety in beauty so here we have quite an interesting cultural difference in beauty and we have the idea on the left of whitening skin making your skin more white to be more beautiful Versus the idea on the right of getting a tan or getting a suntan. So in northern European countries where it's difficult to get a suntan, you need time, you need money. You need the time and money to go on holiday and to lie about doing nothing in the sun to get a suntan and having a tan, a healthy tan, they say, is considered very attractive. It's considered more beautiful. When someone is very white, 
in Northern Europe, people consider that it means they stay inside too much. It means someone who doesn't have much of a social life. It might mean someone who works in computers in an office and doesn't see the sun. Now, you contrast that to Asia, where having a tan often means that someone works outside and therefore doesn't have a very high quality job on average. And it's actually people who have more time and money who can make their skin whiter. And so on the left, we have that kind of emphasis of status and wealth then coming from whitening of skin. And these, these concepts of status and wealth seem to feed into our society idea of beauty, which is very interesting if you think about it, because it means that our idea of human beauty is not the same as our idea of other types of beauty. Because with human beauty, it seems to be connected to health, status, wealth, and things like that. Can anyone think of a, an unhealthy, poor, low status person who is you think is beautiful very beautiful an unhealthy poor low status person who has a lot of physical beauty and dominico has just said in very interesting language beauty is in the eye of the beholder <laughs> my cat is now in the way of the chat Oi. Ah. All right, let's move on to another area of cultural variety. Here we have hair. So obviously there are certain times when people want to make their hair as beautiful as possible. And there seems to be a lot of cultural variety in the types of hair that are considered beautiful in different cultures. If you look here in the bottom left, what do you think of that? What do you think of that hairstyle in the bottom left? That hairstyle costs a lot of money. A lot of money. This is a fayera from the festival in Valencia called Las Fayas. And this hairstyle is very expensive. Very, very, very expensive. Do you like it? Does everybody think it's very beautiful? Or do you prefer one of these others? In the top right, we've got the afro which in some cultures is considered attractive. Not only the African descendant communities, but also there is a ginger afro, which you can get from descendants, Kel Celtic descendants, basically. They have a ginger afro. And then in the top left, we've got the Japanese geisha hairstyle again, requires a lot of maintenance and it's very, very expensive to create and maintain that hairstyle. So that's just another example of a cultural variety of beauty. And that's one element of how beauty varies. So it's one kind of evidence for some subjective element of beauty. Now, let's go on to personal taste. Personal taste. So that means, what's your opinion? This is how different people think that different things are beautiful. So we're no longer contrasting cultures. 
Now we're just contrasting people. Like, what does Pavia think is beautiful? And then what does Domenico think is beautiful? What does Pallavi think is beautiful? And what does Manuel Gordillo think is beautiful? What do different people think is beautiful? Here we've got some art, some visual art. So which one of those do you think is the most beautiful? Do you think any of them has no beauty? Maybe you think some of them has negative beauty. Some of them, for you, maybe they have disgust. They are disgusting rather than beautiful. In the top left, we have the, the Fountain by Duchamp in 1917. Yes, that is a urinal. It's called the fountain, but it is in fact a urinal. Top right, we have the Mona Lisa, considered by some to be a masterpiece and considered by others to be quite poor quality and not very, not very beautiful. Sleepwalker says the Mona Lisa is the most famous. I think that everyone would agree that the Mona Lisa is the most famous. But that doesn't necessarily make it the most beautiful. Daisy likes the balloon dog. How much would you pay for the balloon dog, Daisy? How much would you pay for the balloon dog? Anawat says, my scientific brain dominates the artistic brain too much. I think it's probably better to have that situation, Anawat, because opening up your artistic brain is quite easy, actually. All you need to do is let go. Let go and go with the possibilities. Also, it's super fun to explore your artistic side. It's so fun. You know, exploring your scientific side can be fun as well. But you need to read loads and study as well. It's difficult. But exploring your artistic side, it's, it's really fun. You know, for example, have you ever been to an opera? If not, go. You can go and you can say that's rubbish and come away from it. That's fine. But it's still fun. It's fun to go, it's fun to experience it, and it's fun to talk about it afterwards and say, that's rubbish, or I liked that. Exploring your artistic taste is really fun. I can make twisted balloons, so wait, pay for it. So Daisy, that is not made of twisted balloons. It's made, I believe, of metal, and that particular sculpture will set you back for $58 million. That's what that sculpture sold for. I'll say that again. The balloon dog in this picture sold for $58 million. $58 million. I can't remember the name of the artist, but if you Google balloon dog art you'll get it okay let's move on to another another area of taste we're gonna go for food so look at the pictures here of the different things in these pictures i have some questions for you question one what are these pictures what is number one what's number two what's number three what can you see in the picture can you type in the chat what you can see in the picture? 
Question two, how do you think these pictures relate to the idea of personal taste? So what can you see in the picture and how do these ideas relate to personal taste? What can you see in the picture and how do these ideas relate to personal taste? All right, so we've got people saying fish. I want something more specific. It's not just fish, but it's a certain type of fish. Isn't it, Pepper? Eh? Oh, Pepper. Is it a certain type of fish, Pepper? Sleepwalker, you're close with sardines, but it's not sardines. It's something similar to sardines, but not sardines. We also have natto. That's right. The bottom right is natto. It's fermented soybeans. Mackerels. No, not mackerels. Don't think so, anyway. Lavi says, I don't know the name of the fish. Okay. Diorians, that's right. So picture number two, that is the top middle. We've got Diorians. So what do you think about how these pictures are connected to personal taste? How are these pictures connected to personal taste? You can see she wanted to get away when I put her on my knee and now that I put her I let her go now she's wants to be on my knee. Don't play with the mic stand pepper. I think of having cats as kind of training for having children. It increases your tolerance. Increases your tolerance for constant disruption. Marmite and butter is the best, says Mandula. So they all have specific tastes. Another thing we could say about them is you love them or you hate them. You love them or you hate them. In fact, for Marmite, they actually made an advertisement campaign based on that. Marmite, you love it or you hate it. Either you love it or you hate it. It's just one of those things. And that's the same for the other ones. Natto, Durian. What's the top right? Did anyone get the top right? It's quite interesting because it has very interesting pronunciation, the one in the top right. Very interesting pronunciation. Ginger, not quite. It is a root. It's a type of root. It's not cinnamon. It's licorice.
Licorice. Look at the pronunciation of that. Licorice. 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 Does anyone like licorice? There it is. It's often often sweet. Licorice. Yeah, licorice is black. Has quite a strong taste. Some people love it, some people hate it. So that really epitomizes the idea of personal taste, how taste can vary subjectively. So for each person, taste is different. Taste can vary subjectively. Taste can vary subjectively. Subjective personal taste taste all right what new vocabulary did you see today what was your favorite type in the chat any vocabulary you heard today that you found interesting we had subjective objective personal taste cultural variety and anything else that you found interesting you can type in the chat and we'll have a little discussion about that and while you think about the interesting vocabulary that you heard today in today's lesson on aesthetics, I'd like to give you the homework. The homework is for Saturday, so just a few days to do that. I'd like you to discuss the beauty of something you consider art, but other people don't necessarily agree. For me, there are many video games that I consider to be art. Not necessarily all video games, but certainly a good number of video games, and not everyone thinks that video games are art. I think that's nonsense, of course they are. So I'd like you to discuss the beauty. What is it about that thing that you appreciate that is beautiful? And it's good to choose a topic where you think something's beautiful, but many people don't agree. Something that you think is beautiful but many people don't agree. Record a short audio and send it to me on our chat server. That is bit.ly slash englandchats. That's where you can join our server. Palavi says it's a difficult homework. Not really. I just want you to describe something that's beautiful, Palavi. And it's even better if it's something that other people don't think is beautiful or maybe something you think is underappreciated so something you really like but you think you know people don't appreciate this many people don't seem to realize how beautiful this thing is i'm asking you palavi to look for the beauty in the world that other people don't see and then talk about it All right, does anyone have any comments about the vocabulary from today? Try Marmite once. Marmite is very interesting. It's made primarily from yeast. Yeast is what we use to make bread go up, make bread rise. That's yeast. Pavia says that wine connoisseur was my favourite. And although the idea of a connoisseur comes from wine, we do actually use the word connoisseur about all kinds of different things now. So we could talk about a connoisseur of art. We could talk about a video game connoisseur. All right, everybody, we are moving on now to question time. You can, of course, download the notes from today's class. And those notes are now linked in the chat. So you can download all the notes from today's class, should you wish. Pallavi says, can I talk about anything I think is beautiful for me, teacher? Exactly, Pallavi. That's right. Like Pokemon. Hector. It's like Hector, he just was just waiting for the end of the class for question time to ask questions. 
And then we get to question time and boom, here comes Hector. So Hector says, which sentence is better? He played cricket better than me playing football. He played cricket better than my playing football. He played cricket better than I played football. Definitely number three would be the most normal, the most common. That would be the most common, but the other two would actually be okay. Number two is an example of nominalization, which is a topic that we're going to cover soon. I'll just show you, show you guys this for other people who haven't seen the chat. He played cricket better than my playing football. And even he played cricket better than me playing football. So number two is an example of nominalization. And number one is an example of ellipsis or a reduced clause where actually number one comes from he played cricket better than me when I was playing football. So we've got quite a bit of advanced grammar there. It's useful, of course, to have access to all of these different ways of saying things because it enables you to be more fluent. However, number three, definitely the most common. He played cricket better than I played football. The simplest of them is, of course, the most common, as you might expect. There is no car versus there are no cars. I've heard people say both. What's the difference? There is no car here is kind of the weird one. And there is no car is are very specifically saying there exists no car which and really you would need some context here you can't just say there is no car even there is no car outside doesn't sound great but if we say there is no car which can fly or or we can use it if we're looking for a singular. Like that. My car's out there. Uh, no, there is no car. What? Whereas the kind of easier one to understand, there are no cars. That's the more general situation as well, where in English, when speaking in general, we prefer to use the plural. In all situations, when we speak generally, we prefer to use the plural. Almost always use the plural when we're talking generally. And on that subject, Domenico demonstrates my point by saying I generally, generally dislike dishes related to meat i prefer seafood over meat-based dishes notice the plural meat-based dishes in fact brenner and i are almost vegetarian very good what's the difference between ashamed and embarrassed i feel ashamed i feel embarrassed what's the difference between ashamed and embarrassed primarily here the difference is in use not in meaning So essentially, ashamed and embarrassed are very, very similar, pretty much synonymous. In terms of how they're used, embarrassed is a little lighter. I would say that ashamed for and shamed and ashamed 
for English speakers is, is deeper and often comes from a sense of dishonor or guilt or doing a bad thing. So ashamed is kind of heavier, whereas embarrassed is lighter. It could just be a strong feeling of awkwardness. It could be a social mistake that you made, right? Now, of course, you could be deeply embarrassed, but being very deeply embarrassed gets on to the idea of ashamed. So basically, we can say that ashamed is stronger. Yeah, of course, Pavia, I can answer any questions. We're not just limited to English. Or at least you can... My cat is now scratching my chair. You can ask any questions that you want, and I can't guarantee if I'll answer them or not, but by all means, ask. Pallavi says, can you give me tips on how to crack an entrance exam on the first attempt? Uh, not really, Pallavi. Preparation's a good idea, though. And the further in advance that you start your study and preparation, the better. If you can, try to get past copies of the exam which you're attempting so that you can practice as much as possible. Takeshi says, how do you feel when people call football soccer? Football makes mo so much more sense. I don't really care, Takeshi. Uh, on a joke level, I might happily have an argument with Americans about that. But to be honest with you, when it comes to sort of serious matters, I don't really care. Sleepwalker says, Rich, I've heard that native speakers often use theirs instead of there are in spoken English, even if it's not gr grammatically correct. For example, there's a couple of rooms. Well, Sleepwalker, the question of whether it's grammatically correct is not a simple one, because, in fact, in English, what we need to have is subject-verb agreement. And, of course... In the sentence of there is, the subject is in fact there. Right? And then we have to say, well, is there, is it plural or singular? And there is an ongoing discussion about that with linguists, where some linguists will say, well... It's correct to say there are some people because here, there, although it's a dummy subject, it represents some people and therefore is plural. However, you will hear people saying this a lot and then we have to say, well, could in fact there as a dummy subject operate as a singular and therefore, it's not necessary for it to be plural. In fact, we may even go as far as to say it is incorrect to make it plural. Maybe it's like an uncountable noun. It should always be singular. Of course, the answer to this question is we will be descriptive about our teaching, not prescriptive. That means we do not find rule. We do not invent rules and then tell people how to do stuff. Instead, we simply look at how language is used and then we create the rules. The reality is people do this all the time, especially when talking, especially colloquially. So this in speaking is fine. And in fact, it's probably more normal in speaking than to say there are. However, when you're writing, you might want to use this one just to make the grammarians happy.
Consider this. If you taught something wrong in the class and one of your students pointed it out, will you try to prove what you said was right by asserting it again and again? Oh, what a question. That's not necessarily a question of morality, Pavia. I would say that that's a question of teaching more than anything. If you taught something wrong in class, I mean, it's interesting as well that you said you taught something wrong. This, of course, implies that the teacher knows it was wrong, which often is not the case when a teacher teaches something wrong. And in fact, when anyone, in fact, says something that's wrong, they often think that they're right, even if they're not right. <laughs> So to actually teach something wrong and realize that it's wrong is a less common situation. However, in the situation, let's write this down. In the situation that a teacher realizes, it doesn't really matter if a student pointed it out or not, but in the situation that a teacher realizes something they have taught let's say or said as a teacher because of course when i teach i don't always act as a teacher sometimes i act as a fellow interlocutor that means another student talking to other students i give my opinion and i receive my opinion when i'm in that mode i'm not acting as a teacher and so i accept that my opinion can be fallible that is, what I say might not be true, but that's because I'm just acting as a talker. But then if I act as a teacher, we want, we want what I say to be true. Of course, a teacher has to be able to instruct and help the students find truth and be better at what they're doing. So in the situation that a teacher realizes something they have taught or they have said as a teacher is not true the teacher has an obligation to inform the students of this discovery so that is my perspective on that and I'm waiting now for someone to point out all of the times that I've been wrong in class so that I have to go through the horrible process of admitting that I was wrong and telling everyone instead what the right situation is. From my perspective, to be a good teacher, you must, you must, if you have said something in class that's not true and you're still teaching that class then you should tell the class. You have to tell them. It's awkward. It sucks. Right? And it's happened to me plenty of times. Remember, I have my video, Teachers Are Not Gods. We make mistakes. We are fallible. It doesn't matter how good you become. You're still going to make a mistake. And also, just what how you think about things will change. And then, obviously, there is this situation specifically that Pavia mentions, which is that a student has identified a problem. And that's even worse, because you're supposed to be the person teaching people, so it feels so... it's so bad. But you have to go with that. Even if it's embarrassing or whatever, you have to go with it. And you have to accept that it is likely to cause a loss of confidence with your students. That will happen. So it's definitely not a situation that you want to happen regularly, but you have to take it. The objective here is truth. And so if you've said something and later it's obvious that that's not true or you discover it's not true or a student points out that it's not true, you have to stop the... You tell everyone. Everybody! I made a mistake before, and I want to correct it. And then...
tell them and show them and say, hey, it happens. And then let's hope it doesn't happen often. <laughs> Soccer is a very strange name since nobody uses socks. To be fair, Alexander, there are lots of strange names for things. So I'm not really worried about what people call it. I know it's a fun it's a fun topic of conversation, but seriously, it doesn't matter. You can call it whatever you want. Call it banana ball if you want. How should I use cum plus gerund and cum plus infinitive and bare infinitive? What's that? When do we do that? Come to run? Come running? He came running. He came to run. He came to play. Come to do something. Come to do something. Come do something. Come doing something. Hmm, interesting. I would say that come to do means come for the purpose of doing. So, for example, come, come to play means come for the purpose of playing. Come here, come to play. Come do is like calling someone. Come here and do this. Come do this. Come eat. Come here and eat. So used often as a command. And then come ing, come doing means move somewhere that's the come element while ing so he came running I come to class running every day <laughs> all right does that make sense I think I think that's the basic gist of what we have there with these Hopefully that helps you out. Maybe I've missed something there. I feel kind of tired, so I'm not thinking about it fully right now. Daisy says, teachers hate being criticised. My old teacher used to mispronounce the English words. I pointed it out and he said, you're not a certified English teacher. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, Daisy. That is... Um, I mean, what that what that means, Daisy, is that you've upset him or her with the way that you said, with the way that you mentioned it, right? Whenever someone says like, oh, but you're, who do you think you are? You're not an, a certified, you know, I remember I, I had a comment like this from a friend of mine who said to me, something along the lines of do you think my wife has time to discuss this with you she has a phd in international relations who do you think you are talking about this now of course to actually think that is just to actually think that your opinion is true because you're an expert is a ridiculously elitist position to have and really, all it means, if someone leans on their expertise, it means that they're upset. It means that they've been upset by the comment and they're reacting to that upset. That's all it is. Raul Pandi says, say my name. All right, Raul. I came to know that there are man-made disasters and natural disasters on YouTube. Very interesting dichotomy there, Julia. 
similar to the dichotomy we discussed today about aesthetics. Be humble and accept your mistakes and correct it, says Mina. Yes. And, you know, you need to be humble and you need to correct it. And then you need to make a bit more effort, you know, but that's OK. People make mistakes. But then, of course, you want to be on guard because you want to make sure that the rest of your class is nice and tight. Of course, some mistakes are more understandable than others. Pure Curse, as our literature teacher, was 83 years old. She was very kind. I remember her whenever I listened to old English songs. That's amazing, Pure Kerr. 83. I admire someone who is able to teach at 83 years old. It must have been a fascinating experience. <coughs> he asks, when will you receive a certification? Is it a joke, though, Daisy, or is it serious? I never eat meat versus I don't eat meat, says Takeshi. Well, they basically mean the same thing, Takeshi, outside of context. But of course, never is stronger. But essentially, outside of context, they mean the same thing. Palavi says, you missed my question. I asked about giving advice on delivering a speech. Let me see, Palavi. Hang on. Bum, 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 bum. Where is that? What about giving a speech? Can you give advice? Yeah. I can give advice. Build up experience. Speaking in public. Uh, one example is you can join the local Toastmasters. Or join your school debating society. So building up experience, public speaking is probably the best thing you can do. And now some general tips. Learn to speak using notes, not a script. Don't memorize the exact words. Just memorize your talking points. Never rely on a lot of text in your slides. Use text light slides with attractive images. Experiment with body language, stage position, uh, voice, voice control, Audience interaction, rhetorical questions, jokes, stories, etc. Notice I said experiment, meaning try it, see if it works for you, play around with it and then decide. Of course, all of this should be followed up with reflect on your experience. So after you give a speech... Reflect on the speech, what went well, what didn't go well, what will you do last next time? So I gave a, I gave a speech a few months ago and it was very, very, very good and worked very, very, very well. And I was very happy with it. But I thought like, oh, it was quite short. It finished quite quickly. And, you know, it'd be nice if it was a bit longer because it was it went so well. So the next time I did a longer one and this time it went on far too long, only six minutes. But then I thought I, I reflected on that and watched it and I thought, wow, this is really boring. <laughs> it was good for like two minutes, but then after that it gets awkward and boring. And you can see at about five minutes, there's like some applause, like people are like, oh, that's it. Well done. And then I continue for another minute. So... That made me think, right, in that context, in that situation, a shorter speech would have been more impactful. And speaking of length, I think it's about time that I wrapped up. Are there any final questions that we have there? No, that's it. Everybody, if you haven't done so far, smash 
that like button. Hit that like button right now to say that you enjoyed the stream and that you're very, very happy with that. And can I say also a big thank you to Sonia Botterini for a 10 euro super thanks. Thank you, Sonia. I do appreciate it. I think I mentioned this before, but if you would like a level test and to consider some classes, do drop me an email. And that goes for everybody. I am recruiting a few students at the moment. So if you're interested in taking classes, then you can send me an email, professorreach at gmail.com, and we'll talk about my rates and availability. There's not a lot of it. So if you are interested, then jump on with that right now. All right, folks, thank you very much for watching. My name has been Teacher Rich, Professor Rich. It's my pleasure, and I'll see you on Saturday.